About a dozen years ago, a 12-year-old boy in Canada saw a newspaper story about a boy in Pakistan who was murdered after daring to challenge the exploitation his own in child labor. Craig Kielberger didn't just weep about that, he took action, asking his classmates to join him in starting Free the Children. It became a global phenomenon, defending the powerless, building schools, educating hundreds of thousands of children on a daily basis in countries all across the world. Somewhere in all of that, he managed to convince his parents to let him take two months off, schools, off school and go backpacking at the age of, I don't know, 13 or 14, across Southeast Asia. What an incredible young man. He's now 25, still involved, still speaking out. You've seen him on Oprah, CNN, 60 Minutes, and the Today Show. And now he's here with us at the Up Experience. Please welcome Craig Kielberger. You're gonna think. Good afternoon. And in the true spirit of the Up Experience, can I ask everyone to please stand up for a moment, to put your hands high up into the air and just stretch. Oh yeah. And sit back down. We've had a long day but an amazing day, and a lot of extraordinary speakers who have brought different perspectives, ideas, and how we look at the world. And for the last 20 minutes that you're here, I want to put on the table some very simple, easy, everyday actions to how we can change how we look at this world, but more importantly, change the world for the better. And like many of you, I started my morning with a newspaper at my front door. Maybe you looked at the New York Times this morning. Maybe you saw on the front page the article that was there, Fighting in Chad Stirs Fears of Wider Conflict. Or maybe you looked at the Houston Chronicle on the front page, and the story, this one was especially horrific, The Next Generation of Terrorists, U.S. Military Says Al-Qaeda is Training Children, looking at using children as suicide bombers. There was a period in my life where I stopped reading the newspaper. Because every time when you woke up in the morning and you picked up the newspaper, it always had a story that was angry and depressing and frustrating, and it felt like it was always the same. Maybe a different country, and maybe a different twist, maybe a different region of the world, but it was always the same, war and violence and suffering. And so I just didn't even want to look at it. Until one day, I was talking with one of the members of our board of directors, an amazing man, an amazing supporter of our work by the name of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And of course, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for fighting against apartheid in South Africa. And I told him how I had stopped reading the paper. And I just started my university at that point. And I remember he looked at me and he said, college boy, what are they teaching you in school? He said, you're looking at the world completely the wrong way. Because when the newspaper arrives at his door in the morning, he doesn't look at it as a collection of all the war and the violence and the poverty and the suffering. But instead, and the archbishop is obviously a deeply religious man, he said he looks at that newspaper every day as God's to-do list delivered right to his front door for him. And how he starts his morning is by laying the newspaper out flat on his kitchen table and he reads it with his kids and now his grandkids as literally a menu of issues in the world that need his help. And even said, it's conveniently divided as a menu. If you want to help on local issues, it's the first couple of pages and the national keep going and then international as you flip. But that simple way to shift how we look at the world, that simple change is incredibly empowering. And that's what I want to talk about, those simple actions we can make, and especially in the time that I have with you, in three areas. How we can make a difference in our families. I know there are a lot of parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents with us here. So how do we raise socially conscious and compassionate children? In our workplaces, what simple acts can we bring back to where we work that make a tangible and real difference? And in our daily lives very personally and very individually. If we're going to change the world, 
the first thing we need to do is change the way we look at the world. Can we bring up the slides, please? This is the image of the world that we were taught from the earliest days. But maybe looking at the world simply as a geophysical formation of landmass isn't the most effective way to truly see our values, what's important to us in the world. Maybe instead we need a slight shift. Maybe instead if we looked at the world instead through the light of world population, we would put our own countries and regions in comparison. I'm from Canada. It's still there for the record, but just a lot smaller. But in seriousness, it helps us drill down because maybe more accurately, if we looked at the world instead at poverty, if we looked at those who are living on less than a dollar a day, what the UN defines as absolute poverty, well then of course we see again a very different world take shape in front of our eyes. And the U.S. and Canada disappear off this map, as does Europe. There are problems here at home, and we just heard some of them, of course, on issues of immigration. But when you're looking at absolute poverty, what the U.N. again defines as under a dollar a day, the 1.1 billion people who live in that absolutely brack-breaking and destructive poverty. This is the world we live in. And there are a lot of causes for that poverty, from, of course, corruption to HIV AIDS to conflict. But one of the latest emerging problems is something we heard a lot of on the stage today, and the issue of the environment. But when it was talked about today, we had images that often showed it as a distant challenge. The implications coming in some far-off date. We see the reality already affecting countries along the equatorial lines. Of course, Poverty, AIDS, war, but today global warming. The rains don't fall like they used to, and when they do fall, they fall so fast and so hard, they rip away the topsoil, and they take the plantation with them. They take the seeds with them. And we see when you look at the world at CO2 emissions, to really understand, although parts of the world like sub-Saharan Africa, along the Ecuadorial line, suffer the greatest implications of global warming, well, they're not the countries that are the greatest emitters. You know, a lot of people wrote Africa off the map. I remember The Economist did a front page picture and said lost continent. And the belief is we've tried, we've, we've done our best, we've worked at development. But the truth is we've never tried. There's never been something like a Marshall Plan from the ashes of World War II in Europe. We've never systematically gone about helping development in Africa where statistically there's the greatest need. In fact, if you take 10 years... 1995 to 2005, and in those 10 years, calculate every form of aid that went to Africa, multilateral, so the UN and different agencies, bilateral, USAID, country to country, individual citizens, your money, you reached into your pockets and donated. That 10-year period, 42% went to something called Tide Aid. We didn't give aid, we gave products and services, usually farm-grown wheat and other products. Feeds people short-term, but doesn't create long-term independence. 16% was consultants and donors from wealthy countries. 26% emergency aid, the Geldof, the food aids of the world. Again, important, but doesn't create long-term independence. 14% was debt servicing. We gave them the money to pay us the interest on the money we lent them, if you understood that equation, which left less than 2% for something called core development aid, schools, roads, hospitals, what it takes to create a long-term independence. Or again, if you want to shift the way we look at this world, last year in our world, we spent $18 billion on makeup on cosmetics. $18 billion. That's about what the UN, UNDP estimates it would take to eliminate the worst forms of hunger and malnutrition in this world. We've seen those celebrities snapping their fingers for live aid. That works out to a child dying from poverty every two seconds. 33,000 children a day, mostly from hunger-related causes. We spent $15 billion on perfume. That's three times what it would take to provide universal literacy. If you put every child in school, not only would they learn to read and write, but you would address issues from peace building to eliminating madrasas and religious extremism. You provided universal primary education. You'd prevent seven million new AIDS infections in the next 10 years. Never mind the fact that an ice cream in Europe alone, more than $11 billion just in Europe, 
That's more than it would take to provide antiviral drugs and AIDS education to every person who so desperately needs it in Africa. There are two ways to look at these numbers. We can either be overwhelmed by them and frustrated by them, or we can sit back and just look at it and realize it's possible. It's very possible to eliminate the worst forms of poverty in this world in the lifetime of your children. That's not an idealistic statement. Every World Bank, every IMF, every study agrees we have the resources and the knowledge. It's just a question of if we have the will. And I believe that will is there. You all heard in the introduction how we started as a group of kids. Well, in fact, it was inspired in grade seven classmates and we started this organization, Free the Children. We now have 2,000 chapters of our groups in schools all across North America. Young people fundraising to build more than 500 schools in developing countries. 20,000 alternative income cooperatives for women. Not charity, helping people lift themselves out of poverty. 1,500 youth who roll up their sleeves, high school and college students, to go build schools and volunteer. Which brings me to what I wanted to talk about for those three areas. First, family. I was inspired by a newspaper story. I was 12, I wasn't looking for a cause. I was looking for the comics in the local paper. I really was. And I saw this photo of a young child laborer who escaped, spoke out, and he was murdered. Young people today are more aware and more informed than any previous generation, and parents have to make a choice. So often, adults try to shelter youth from the poverty. They, they tell young people they're too young, they don't have to worry about it, to close their eyes. They'll make a difference when they're older. But youth can't close their eyes. They see the front pages. They experience bullying in the schoolyards. They know they're suffering. If they can't close their eyes, they close their hearts. I was traveling with the Dalai Lama just this summer in Northern Ireland, and he beautifully encapsulated, he said, we are raising a generation of passive bystanders. Parents face a choice. And when I talk to parents, so often they say that what they're looking for is to raise kids who are responsible and level-headed and compassionate. They have to create those opportunities consciously for kids. And when they do, not only are kids helping others, but it helps themselves. Study after study shows that when youth volunteer, when they learn about the world, when they serve others, it's empowering. Not only do they have a broader perspective about the world, but it shows it raises marks. It boosts teen self-esteem. The University of Virginia did an awesome study. They brought in global citizenship for kids, had them volunteer in a blind, double-blind study. Those who volunteered got higher grades, less likely to use or abuse drugs, more likely to go into post-secondary education. When we run volunteer trips for kids overseas, we know we've run a successful trip when flying back through London Heathrow's airport, they borrow calling cards from our chaperones. They call up their parents. They thank them. That's very sweet. And then the young women on the trip borrow the calling cards, call up their boyfriends, and dump them from the airport. It shifts the way you look at the world in small ways and in very real ways. So how do you live it in your family? Tomorrow morning, lay that newspaper out flat on the kitchen table. Read it as a family. Other simple actions. Map of the world on your child's bedroom. Jar of loose change. Number two, create a family tradition of service. How do you celebrate the holidays? Imagine going with your family to the local soup kitchen. January rolls around. New year, new you. Empty closet for a cause. Give it to local needy groups. This summer, volunteer trip as a family. An alternative family vacation. Go with us, go with Habitat, go with any group that's out there. There are tons of different organizations. I'm not making a pitch for free the children. I'm saying at the end of the day, the opportunities exist. And number three, be the change. You are the most important role models to your kids. 73% of youth, when asked why they volunteer, say they started with their parents. This brings us to the second part, workplace. I've had the chance to sit down with amazing heads of state and CEOs, but the greatest lessons on business, meaningful business I've ever learned, was actually here 
in a rural indigenous community of Ecuador with the Purje indigenous group. We were volunteering building schools high in the mountains. Our school supplies didn't arrive on time. We went to the village elder. We explained our problem. We said, we can't finish building the school. We have plane tickets going back. We, we don't have enough hands. Even if everyone in the community worked together, we couldn't accomplish this goal. And she just looked at us and she said, no problem. I'll call a minga. And she stepped out of her hut in her local language in Quechuan. She just shouted these words. She said, there will be a minga tomorrow. And the next day, by word of mouth, there's no phone, no electricity here. Word spread to all the neighboring villages. People poured out en masse. They helped to build this school for this one community. The other villages would never benefit. But they did it for this one community in solidarity. We asked her what was this minga, and she actually translated it for us as a coming together of people to work for the collective good. She explained the rallying nature, how by working together in the spirit of solidarity, you build a community. And then she looked to us and she said, in your language, how do you say minga? And we looked at each other, 15 young volunteers, and we we looked at this like spontaneous coming together that had filled en masse this village and everyone working for the collective good. And we, we thought volunteer work, not the same barn raisings. No, we said in our language, it's kind of like a riot, but for good. There's no word for minga, but I believe we need a minga in our families, in our faith group, in our communities, but also, I'd even say, in the place where we work. These are the photos of the women in the building. What I mean by a minga is an incredibly powerful lesson how to forge community. You want to build a stronger work team, give them a goal that unites them together. Studies show that when employees volunteer together, it boosts productivity. The University of Ottawa found this. Even when you discount the fact that they're missing time, pardon me, even when you include the fact that they're missing time volunteering, it still overall is a boost in productivity by six to seven percent. Maybe it's, you know, Sean from Harvard would tell us employees are happier. I don't know why. But volunteering together is the greatest team builder out there. And number two, pride and service. In the nonprofit world, we recruit people away from Morgan Stanley, from Chase, from uh, Harvard, Stanford. We have no problems recruiting the best and the brightest into our organization and retaining them. We pay a fifth to a tenth of what they used to earn. I've never understood why corporate America doesn't take a lesson from the nonprofit world. People don't just want a paycheck, they want meaning where they work. Help your employees understand they're part of something important. You don't have to be building schools overseas, but no matter what you do, no matter what your workplace is, you are serving someone, you are helping someone, or else you wouldn't be in business. It's helping the person in pharma understand they're finding a cure. It's helping the person in a holiday vacation place understand they're putting a smile on someone's face. I was at an event we did with local public service employees and a garbage man stood up with pride and said he keeps our city streets clean. Help reframe what your employees do, even the receptionist. Help him or her understand they're the front face of the company and how they fit into the larger service they provide. And number three, make corporate social responsibility real. We hear a lot of buzz about it, but how do you live it? Like Xerox, do an environmental audit. They saved 1.5 billion pounds of waste and saved $2 billion over 10 years. Or for example, Aleve, who's the number one users of the products? Suffering from arthritis. They took part of their ad money and gave it to charity. They did a co-branding initiative. It was a brilliant idea. They're the national sponsor of the Arthritis Walk. The people who need to get the message hear it. Team Depot at Home Depot logged over a million hours of service or lens crafters. Leverage your indigenous capacity. In their case, in the 1980s, they started recycling used glasses. 1.2 million glasses later, they're given the gift of sight. No wonder it's consistently ranked as one of the top 100 employers in America. 
And last but not least, you. This is a poster from Apple. It was put in one of their workplaces as a recruit. Your life is busy, but is it full? Find your issue, your gift. What do you naturally love to do? And the best way that I could try to illustrate this is that it takes courage and it takes passion, but most importantly, it takes a single step of commitment. And this is the lesson I learned from one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. And I've had the honor to sit down from the Pope to the Dalai Lama to royalty to you name it, but it was a simple school teacher. And her name was Agnes. She came from Eastern Europe, and at a very young age, she knew she had a passion. For her, it was teaching. She went off to a developing country. She started to teach in an all-girls private school. And every day, she would walk from her home to the school. And as she did this, she walked past a slum, a shantytown. For more than 10 years, she would look but never ventured in. Until one day, she fell very ill. She had tuberculosis. And she took this train ride to a medical sanctuary to seek treatment. And she started to ask herself these questions we don't ask nearly enough of in our life. And ask herself, why am I here? What do I hope to accomplish with my life? What's my purpose? What is my legacy? And she promised that never again would she just walk by. And immediately when she was better, she returned home and was walking to the school. And a woman in an alley called out to Agnes. The woman was gaunt and sick and looked like she needed help. And Agnes faced a choice. She could have done the same thing she did for 10 years. Or she could turn to this woman. And she went up to the woman. And Agnes picked up this woman and put her in a taxi. And they went to a hospital. But neither of them had enough money and they were turned away and went to another hospital and again they were turned away. And so in desperation, Agnes brought this woman into her own home and lay her in her own bed and just held her hand and comforted her until eventually that woman passed away. And with that simple act, Agnes not only touched that woman's life and not only changed her own life, but went on to change the lives of millions and millions of people around the world. And you may not know the name Agnes, but you know the name she took when she took her vows. That was Mother Teresa. That's how she started. This iconic figure of compassion, even she had to take the first step. And I had the honor to meet and to work alongside Mother Teresa in Calcutta before she passed away. And the words I want to leave you with are the words she left me with. Because I asked her, how do you do it? How do you work every single day with people around you who are suffering and who are dying when no matter what, you can't help every person? And she just looked at me. And when she looked at you, you felt like she was looking into your soul. And she said, you have to realize in our lives, we can do no great things but we can do small things with great love. And that's how you change this world.